Hello and welcome to Promenade Culture Center. This is Culture Corner. Today we bring you another story, a creative story of a very creative individual. With us today is Shahad Bishara, a founder and curator of visual therapy. Shahad, so lovely to have you here today. Lovely to have you be here actually yes, yeah, and thank, thank you for finding some time in a in an always busy schedule <laughs> i'm sure although summer is before us yeah i'm hoping that um leaves you some time for a for a good creative break yes i'm looking forward to that we <laughs> always start these stories um with how early did we feel we want to do what we are doing right now and whether this interest for culture and arts uh, is stemming from our early childhood and from our early experiences or not. Because it's very rare to have a curator uh, to work with. Um, um, and Kuwait is a relatively small artistic and cultural scene. Yeah. Uh, so we'd love to hear your story of how, um, of how the Shah Shahad became <laughs> what she became. Yeah, absolutely. So... Um... I think it started around like when I was probably like five or six years old. Um, my aunt, uh, Auntie Sabiha, she's uh, she I think I would say she still is. She still does work. But at that time, um, she was quite an established Kuwaiti artist. She was one of like the first uh, group of Kuwaiti artists to um, inhabit the free atelier. Mm -hmm. um, I believe um, she was working in the 70s and 80s in Kuwait. And uh, during that time, um, when, when I was five or six, is when I really started to kind of recognize and see what she was doing. She would um, come over and bring a lot of her paintings. And I was just like really curious um, as to what was going on. And she took me to her studio and I would color and draw there. So I think that's that was that defining moment for me that kind of really opened up my eyes to like art and like, oh, hey, like I have a relative who who does these and paints and we have artwork hanging in our in our living room um, from her. So that to me was the point where I was like, OK, art is cool. Art is fun. I really love coloring. I really love drawing. And it kind of just sprung from that. So you stayed strongly on that path even through your um, primary education and later. Yeah, I mean, I, I continued obviously like, you know, middle school, you know, you, you, you do your thing, you, you paint, you color, you, you learn about the foundations of art. Uh, but I think it was not until high school where I really kind of took it to a, a, a maybe a higher level. Um, especially around 11th and 12th grade, because I think that's when you really get to focus on um, your skills and really lear learn um, specific kind of skill sets in art, like sculpting and portraiture and wheel throwing and things like that. So um, in 12th grade, I, um, well, I did all the art classes in high school, but in 12th grade, I had this class where it was just me. It was like a kind of uh, like a discovery class where um, I would sit and I would create like my own body of artwork. It's very much like college art training, but um, it was very much self-guided. I had the, the teacher with me, but um, I was by myself. I was doing my thing. It was creating a whole body of work under one theme and I got to display it in like the senior art exhibition. And I won um, best artist in um, 12th oh. grade. Yeah. So, yeah. There th was a boost. Uh, yeah, there was a boost. And it kind of made me realize that, OK, this is what I want to do when I want to go to college. I don't care about English or math mm. or science or any of that. Because my dad was a chemical engineer. Mm. Like he was a, a professor at Kuwait University. So that whole realm didn't really interest mm. me, that domain of like science and math and whatnot. I'm like, no, I need to go into cre something creative. I want to do art, but um, you can't get a scholarship to mm. go do fine arts in Kuwait. I was going to ask that yeah. because we spoke to a lot of people and they said they either opted for something completely different or it was architecture, which felt close. Yeah, no, architecture was never on my mm. mind. I'm like, OK, I, I want to do something in art. I don't want maybe something related to design. So I just kept kind of digging into it. Mm. 
And I saw the graphic design, I think, was like the closest thing to what I wanted to do. And even at that time, like the scholarships to gra for graphic design was like very rare. It wasn't even like a, a, a major that people cared for or that was on the forefront of like art and design. Um, I think not until later it became something that was more common. So yeah, I applied to different schools um, and then I ended up going to San Diego, San Diego State University, and I studied art. So my degree is art uh, with an emphasis in graphic design. Mm. So it has nothing to do with curating at all, you know, but it at that time, like curating wasn't even like on my mind. Like I didn't even know about curating or, or Studying anything. Studying abroad. Yeah. Um, how, how much did uni shape you? Or how much did it change how you felt about art? Oh, so much. Uh, I mean, the teachers were excellent. Um, even with my major, with graphic design, I mean, at that time, like Adobe was like so, so new. It was like, and it's like very, very like maybe first version. So um, all the, the, my professors in university, they didn't care for, oh, you need to go do this on a computer. No, we did everything by hand. We did logos by hand. Um, my first two years of, of school, um, I didn't even do anything related to graphic design. It was all like studio art classes. I did pottery. I did sculpting. I did like studio art. I did life drawing where we paint from like models and stuff. So I was like really, really into it. And I took a lot of art history classes. So that was like a big thing as well. So um, I did like uh, Japanese art history. I did, um, you know, Renaissance. I, I, I studied so much and I actually went deep into it because I realized I was like, whoa, this is really, really interesting. So even very specific periods of like uh, Renaissance or like medieval art, um, we would have classes related to that. So yeah, I think that it sounds very diversified, the, the approach to... Yeah, I mean, it, it's more like foundation based where it's like, okay, we know you want to study interior design or graphic design or art history or whatever, but we want you to have this holistic approach to art. Like we need you to, to draw, we need you to, to dabble with pottery, we need you to do that. Not until my last year of university is when we actually started using the computer for and doing Illustrator and Photoshop and things like that. And even then, it wasn't emphasized. Like if you didn't want to use it, you don't have to. You can kind of just do things by hand. And it was encouraged that we learn to do things by hand. Yeah. Yeah. It's very different from how things are done nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. Now, like you see people, um, the first thing they do is go on their iPads. And even when they sketch and brainstorm, it's always on their iPads. It's always done digitally and like that whole thing. It's its not, you don't really see many people with a sketchbook. I mean, you do, but not. it's not as common as people who sketch with their iPads and You've mentioned that you were exposed to your aunt's art. Yeah. Um, studying abroad for some people we've, we've already talked to, um, either they studied regionally or, or went further abroad. Um, they say it was very different in terms of how much they were not exposed to their culture anymore. So um, how much was it um, Arab art around here and then learning about something else elsewhere or were you always oriented to all sorts of arts and uh... I mean obviously in, when I was in Kuwait when I was growing up like my one of my aunt's really good friends was Jafar Aslah which was another great prominent Kuwaiti, Kuwaiti artist so I was exposed to a lot of different art and there were books that she would bring and you know, we would see, and she collects too. So she has a great collection of Kuwaiti artists. So I would always like see. Um, and then in high school, when I was doing my research, I was very much inspired by like Sami Muhammad. My whole body of work was about um, the human body and the, the angst and the pain. I think it was, it's so on brand for high school students, you mm -hmm. know, like yeah, that uh, age. Yeah, that age. Yeah. So um, I remember I was gifted uh, the Sami Muhammad like big coffee table book by my art teacher. So I was aware of Kuwaiti artists, um, maybe not so much 
international artists. I mean, I knew the few that I really loved, like Monk, for example, you know, uh, obviously the big names like Picasso, Matisse and all of that. But like, it's not till I went to, to, to college till I was exposed to like more young emerging artists. Yeah. yeah. So you come back to Kuwait after, after college mm. and um, is it a sort of a shock? You're supposed to start working, applying your knowledge yeah, in was, a very specific artistic scene. I, I'd like to hear about that time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It, w- it was definitely a shock and um, I just didn't know. Like, I like graphic design, but I felt like I, I just kind of did it to be in to be part of a creative kind of atmosphere in, in university. It, it, it wasn't really my calling, but I was like, okay, I'll give it a chance. It was like my degree says graphic design on it. Yeah, you know, so I kind of have to, to show for it. So I ended up working in this very kind of um, small um, independent uh, agency as a like a junior graphic designer and like my first job right off the uh, that I was working from like 8 to 6 p.m. I was fine with it you know and was like good uh, was great um it, I learned like some some more technical skills on the computer because I like I said yeah. the computer wasn't really on my like on my list of things to learn mm. when I was in college um but after like 6 or 7 months um it just kind of, kind of got tired of it mm. yeah I'm, I'm like this isn't my thing i feel like i'm working with i'm not being able to express myself fully i was very much like working within very specific guidelines and what the client wants which is great i mean it teaches you to be more disciplined it teaches you to to kind of understand that hey like there's corporate work and then there's like kind of free free work that you do for yourself. So with corporate work, you have certain guidelines you work under. There are certain parameters that you have to, to, to meet and abide by. So that was fine. But after a while, I just kind of got tired of it. And I was like, OK, I need to I need to do something else. I was still kind of in the discovery phase of what I wanted to do. So then I applied to a fashion company. Um, I worked at uh, Al um, which is like a, a boutique of a family owned uh, luxury um, fashion boutique. They had like amazing brands, um, fashion brands. So I worked as like the visual merchandiser. So I would do the in store like displays for, for the. Ah, your mm-hmm. first curations. Exactly. It was amazing. Mm-hmm. I loved it. So every like six months, I would come up with. You know, whenever they have a new collection coming in, I would do the in-store displays. And mind you, they had like a huge store. So it wasn't like window displays. I wasn't doing window displays. I was doing in-store displays. So they had this big area in the middle of their boutique that was almost like a stage, you know. So I would uh, come up with this big, grand, like... uh, display or theme and like it was a lot of work actually yeah so I would work with like I would outsource stuff but I would do a lot of stuff by hand which is what I love to do but it was wonderful like I I would come up with I came up with some really really cool kind of displays and I did that for about four years or so that's a long time yeah I worked there for Mm. a while um I enjoyed it. It was the atmosphere was great. The the girls that worked there were also really sweet. And it was like we were all like, you know, like a group of friends and, you know, would sit, we'd talk. I mean, you're in fashion, so it's never really boring. Um, yeah. And everyone gets dressed up to come to work and stuff. So it was kind of cute. Yeah. Did that um, after that, did you choose slowly your path? Yeah. On which you're today? Actually, during that time mm. is when I started visual therapy. Okay. I, so okay. I started. We really vi- want to focus on visual therapy. Yeah, we want to so, know what it is. So it was during that time that I started visual therapy. And at that time, blogging was like a big thing in Kuwait. Like, obviously, 2.48 a.m. was like on the forefront, and there was other big blogs happening. So I'm like, okay, this is like a platform right now that people are using. I'm like, let me kind of dive into it and see. So I started visual therapy. It started off as a blog and I would kind of write about 
other stuff that's happening around the world, I would kind of gonna go and like repost things. Or topics where arts and culture where art, or art, mm. mainly art and c- culture and like different exhibitions that were happening. And at the same time, I would go out to exhibitions that are happening around Kuwait and kind of take pictures and review them. I wasn't like, it wasn't um, critiquing them, but it was just a review of, hey, like, this is what was happening. It must have been very unique at that time then. Yeah, I mean, doing. yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it was it was different. Um, it kind of gained following, not just from local like readers, but I also had international readers and a lot of people would email me and be like, hey, I'd, artists would email me back, hey, I did this do you want to post on this or whatever and um, I remember a really famous because I was writing a lot about street art too and a really famous street art blog um, contacted me and asked me to cover like street art in the Middle East so I would write random articles for them every now and then which was really cool I was like okay this is cool this is like um, a nice kind of outlet for me it was different from fashion and doing all of that yeah so that kind of sprung Something in me that I was like, okay, hey, I love fashion, but I don't love fashion as much as they do. The the girls that go there, they're like live and breathe and eat fashion. I'm like, I like it, but not that much. So I need to kind of follow my calling, which is art. I'm like, I'm, my, I love art. I need to do this. So I um, was like, the next thing for me to do, I think, is to work in an art gallery. I need to work somewhere that's art related. What am I going to do? Um, the governmental like entities like national council and stuff it was on my mind but i just didn't know how to 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 protrude to, to, to penetrate to that, yes. that domain yeah. you know it just seemed like oh i actually i asked people they're like oh you have to apply through the whatever the man i don't There's know like what it was an agency yes for, so to speak yeah. and then then they kind of decide on, on yeah what and I then understand. someone has to nominate you like write a letter i'm like oh my god this sounds like a big headache like i don't even know people like who could do this for me so i'm like okay forget that let me pursue it myself so like a the go-getter that I am that's how I ended up in fashion I actually like emailed them writing them a letter that's saying hey I want to do this and they were very like oh yeah this is this is cute come in for an interview at least let's meet you you know so I did the same with galleries Uh, I emailed a bunch of different galleries what were the galleries that were prominent at the time um are they still around this is what I'm interested in there was Sultan gallery Mm. um there was a gallery actually that where um Do you know the P.F. Chang's that's on the Corniche? That used to be owned by the owner, I think, of Villa Moda, the the sheikh. Um, I forgot what his name, his name was. He had like this huge concept store. Um, and there was a gallery at the top of it called, I, I, I don't remember, but they had some really cool exhibitions happening. There was that. And um, there was... Um, the gallery um, that was on... I forgot the name of it now, but it w- it wasn't called the same thing. The one that's on the seaside, um, do you know? Um, okay, there's a, there's Hub. Hub, uh, yeah. yes, Hub, mm. where where Hub used to be. Mm-hmm. There was another gallery. I think it's owned by the same owners, but they kind of just rebranded. I I, I cannot remember. But Abid uh, Al Qadiri used to work there as the curator there. And I remember Alia Farid, the artist, used to work at that gallery with um, the sheikh. She used to work uh, on the floor, like she used to be like the curator or the exhibition director there. And then there was Dar Funun. So I wrote to all of them. I met with um, the the hub, the previously the previous known one, as, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we kind of got somewhere with that, but then in the end it kind of fizzled out. Uh, and then I met with Dar Fanoon and I'm like, oh my God, this woman, Lucy Topalian, she's the director of Dar Fanoon. She is amazing. And I'm like, she does everything by herself. She's like, yes, I do need help, but I can't pay you like whatever it is that you were getting in terms of salary. I told her, I was like, I don't care. <laughs> I'm oh, like, just I've take me, there. please. Yeah, yeah doing you things know? for experience. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When you're very young, that's a... Uh kind of a normal thing even 
Yeah, you don't uh, care about it. It's now, not... as a person who manages things, I, I very much believe in people being paid for everything they do. But I fully understand the, these experiences that bring you so much more than just uh, financial resources. Yeah, I mean, like at that time, I, I didn't have the experience. So on what basis was I going to ask for X amount of money? You know, okay, I just came in from four years of fashion that has nothing to do with art. Uh, but I was willing to just let it try it out try it out let's see okay so I tried it started with her and um, that was that I mean she not only opened up my eyes to the real world and the business side of art but she exposed me to any her the experience with her was golden like I could truly say she was my mentor you know I got to know collectors I got to know artists because what she was doing at that time in terms of art in Kuwait and art galleries in Kuwait was top I would say like she really was bringing in the best artists she really had like was working and dealing with the best collectors um so yeah and at the same time, she knew about visual therapy and she supported it fully, knowing that like, hey, what I'm doing is also kind of like, I don't want to say competing, no way it would compete with what she was doing. But she was so supportive of it, of it that she let me do my first pop-up exhibition at Dar al Fanun in the summer because the summer was like her dead time. She would travel to the States and the gallery would... She told me that we would close the gallery for three months. I'm like, no, let's not close it. I'm here. Let's do something. So, yeah, I did my first exhibition there. It was during Ramadan. And it was crazy. Like, it was packed. The gallery was full, full. And even she called me, like, a few days later. She was like, oh, my God, I heard from my neighbors. Because she lived there. Like, yeah. So she, the gallery was on the ground floor, and she lives on the first floor with her dogs and her cat. It was awesome. What was the exhibition about, the one you... It was called Not Just a Pop-Up, because um, it was not just a pop-up, you know? So I had um, Kuwaiti artist, who was my first artist that I actually worked with, F-160. Um, and I had an artist from the States who sent me his work. Um, he was one of my followers on the blog and me and him were in touch and whatnot. And um, then I had like a graffiti artist in the courtyard of the gallery doing like kind of like a live art uh, thing. And it was amazing. Um, to be honest, there was no Instagram at that time. No nothing. So the only word of mouth was the blog and other people talking about it. And we spread the word kind of very like just between us friends and it kind of just grew and grew but it was a like a hit like a for the first exhibition I left and I was like oh my god I'm like this is amazing it really left me on a high and I was like okay like for sure this is what I want to do for sure this is what I need to do what a great experience yeah to make sure you're on the right uh, on the right path. yeah I mean I didn't have a space so I was using where I worked yeah. as like Pop and that support, and, it's uh, it's just priceless. Yeah, no, it was amazing. She was she she was an amazing. She's an amazing human being in general. She's so kind, and very supportive, and she has so much like knowledge to share and wisdom of working with artists like throughout the years. And mind you, she never really studied art. Like she, when she first came to Kuwait, she was selling like computers and computer oh. software and IBM and I don't know what. But even her story was like inspiring. And to me, I'm like, oh, like, th this is what I want to do. I want to be like you, you know. So, so this firms your belief in what you're doing. And by this time, you get to know artistic scene, artistic scene uh, very well. Um, what is it like? What is the true art scene now in Kuwait? Oh, now it's very different. Like you're talking like fast forward 15 years later. I've seen the changes like kind of go year after year after year. And even with visual therapy, we've kind of grown it organically and transitioned organically to cater to what's needed and what's wanted within the what scene. What creates the need? I feel like just, you know, generations that are kind of coming 
into the scene and the followers to change and um, what's happening around the world, the technologies that we have now, like especially with social media. I mean, it created like a huge change with like with the art scene and with artists and and things like that. So um, people are being able to kind of expose what mm -hmm. they do very quickly. Yeah. yeah. Whereas before, no. I mean, like you had to really be creative with the way you you know, market yourself. Has something changed in um, in education? Have people, are people studying art more? Uh, yeah, yeah, is for it more sure. accessible? For sure. Mm. Um, there's definitely people that like over time realized that, okay, hey, maybe they did their bachelor's in something, but they're like, okay, now, now I can go do my master's. I can go get an MFA. I can go get my master's in like art history or whatnot. So, and a lot of these people, when they do that, they do that out of, out of their own pocket. You know, no one pays unless they get a scholarship to do that. Um, no one is really getting scholarships to go to do fine art. art. Yeah. So in this setting and with the work you do, what are the biggest challenges, but what are also the opportunities you, you meet? Challenges in terms of personal challenges or no, challenges I within mean, the general I art? mean general within the artistic scene when you're working. Um, because sometimes, for instance, I've, I've spoken to a few curators earlier and they say... Um, it depends on how much artists are supported. If there is if there is a state support, you know, if they get to expose their art, to exhibit, um, how much people know about it, how much the people want to buy art and so on. Because I know you work on some collections and... Uh, yeah. Um, is, um, is that still... Is the, um, is the cultural milieu challenging? Is it the, the, how many artists actually are there? How, how nowadays, how do you... What do, what do you use to frame your work? Like what, what, or do you still go after those things that simply um, you want to do? Like you create projects for yourself or you search certain projects or? Uh, to be honest, it's like a mixed bag of things. Like with year after year, like the more I work on specific projects, the more I realize like, okay, like I, I'm really interested in this aspect more. So in the beginning when I was I was very much focused on exhibitions and doing workshops. It was kind of just to, to You had the space, right? Visual therapy. Yeah, the had, had the, its actual space. Yeah, yeah. Mm. That was one of the you know, like before COVID I had a space. I was um um we had um Haya Abdul Karim, she had the print room and she uh, I was basically using the, the, the loft that the top part of it. Um, and I had it, it was, it was a gallery. Yeah, more or less it was a gallery for, for like a good year or two, it was a gallery. Um, that was my first like shock and, uh, okay, um, I'm paying rent. It wasn't like a, a free space, you know, I was paying rent. So, hey, you need to do stuff all the time in order to make money. So I got a real taste of what gallery life is. I was working with a lot of younger younger artists and I've always worked with mainly young artists. Like that was my whole MO is to support the younger artists because all the bigger artists are kind of getting the support they need. Um, they're kind of taking over like the the spaces and the funding and whatnot and the younger artists needed support. Although I've worked with older artists, I've worked with a full range actually, but I've always felt that the younger artists, um, the you know the less established artists, were was needed my support more. So the gallery was about that. Um, it was good. It lasted, like I said, like a short time, and then I felt like that this is this is stressful. Um, it's taking the fun out of things. I want to do exhibitions when I feel like it's the right. And that's yeah. that's a, a pleasure and a luxury that you know you can afford <laughs> yourself. That's... I mean, like, yeah, I didn't want my focus just to be on exhibitions. I felt like there's more to the art scene than just art exhibitions. There's there's There has to be more ways for us to support artists than not just doing art exhibitions, you know, through... So this is when um, I'm finally decided that, no, I want to not, not be a gallery, 
but I want to kind of shift my my work into being an art consultancy. So within the art consult- consultancy, there I do do exhibitions, but it's more like, no, now I'm focused on building collections. So through building collections, I can support artists by acquiring their work. Um, managing different projects, like, for example, art residencies, um, um, commissions, art commissions for different, you know, clients that need that. So find different ways to support artists that's not just focused on art exhibitions. Because to be honest, as much as I love selling artwork, I, I it's not like my thing like I'm, I'm always focused more it's on the priority for you yeah yeah I'm you know uh, I, I I do I'm, I'm interested in supporting artists I'm interested in curating but selling art art is is kind of like second level or third level for me it's it's not really we jumped a little bit like you said from the time at Dar al Funun and then I asked you about the current artistic scene so I just want to cover those years before visual therapy became what it became. Uh, so at some point you you phased out of Dar, uh, Dar al-Funun, right? Yeah, I, I, I mm. left Dar al-Funun mm. um, and I just kind of focused on visual therapy at that time, yeah. yeah. And um, um, I wanted to focus a little bit on how you work with artists. Um, you've mentioned a lot of ways of how you support an artist nowadays through, through consultancy. But uh, for instance, we do we do a program together with Promenade Culture Center. We're very uh, very happy to um, to have created an uh, art residency, and let's say even two art residencies in a way, because one is the backbone of a cultural center, which I firmly believe in, um, and then the other one is also the mural residency, which we do on and off, which is kind of a gift to a to a location where we where the center is located because it's a commercial center. Um, your work with an artist, uh, so far we've seen you personally work with a lot of artists here at the center and they have never left um, without expressing how supported they were and how well understood they were. What's the, what's the formula? Um, to be honest, there's no formula. It's just about finding the right people to work with. Like, like I said, uh, even when we were um, looking through the submissions, I'm like, I kept telling you that, hey, um, working with artists, it's it's all about, to me personally, it's about chemistry. You know, you need to have good chemistry with the artists in order to get a good result. You know, um, if an artist is difficult, I mean, whatever, chemistry is like subjective, right? Like maybe an artist to you doesn't seem as difficult, but with me, because I'm kind of pushing for for different things it it feels more difficult you know so um i feel like chemistry is really important even more important than their work sometimes because you know when you when you find when you work with an artist and there's good flow between you i think the work will come naturally like the yeah. good work mm-hmm. will will come just because they're willing to take your points you're willing to hear them out and it's just kind of you know flowing in yeah, a good direction yeah. yeah so to me that's a big thing i i don't i'm i'm always open to working with new artists um i'm i'm always interested to seeing what um new, what new things are coming out and what you know uh, different artists are working with so i'm always on the lookout but I feel like chemistry is the biggest thing. So it's it's always the first thing I feel out. And it's like, hey, I've worked with this artist before. I know I know them and I know that they're a good fit for this or that. So I feel like that's my knack. Like I, I, I know I have an eye for certain things and like I'll, I'll, I'll understand. So when I s- learn about a project, I'm like automatically I can understand like, who would be a good fit for that without having to go through those trials and errors and stuff. There are a lot of great projects you did in the past years and um, I can think of some, but I'd like you to mention some that you really enjoyed working on, whether they were complex or simple, doesn't doesn't matter. Because 
You mentioned art consultancy, acquiring uh, collections, working on collections, uh, working on building an artist and so on. So what are some of the projects you'd, you'd, uh, you'd like to share for, uh, for what they brought to you personally? Mm, if I think of like my greatest achievement as a, as a curator, I would say it, it would be the sculpture I did with MBK um, and the Imarati artists. Um, I mean, it didn't require curating, but it was a lot of project management. So I was the middle person. I basically um, proposed, they, they told me that, hey, we want a sculpture. I proposed several different artists to them, uh, local artists and regional artists. They chose the artist, and then I basically was the middle person between the artist and the client. And I watched this project grow from a simple idea, a sketch on paper, to a, um, a um, I don't want to say, a 15 or 18 meter sculpture. Um, the it's quite impressive. It is really yeah. impressive. And it's like, if you really understand the work and the blood, sweat and tears that yes. went into this, mm -hmm. um, you would be even more impressed because it was literally a year and a half in the making. It was done. All of it was done in Dubai. It oh. was shipped mm -hmm. by land to Kuwait. It came by land, shipped on huge, you know, um, lorries. I don't even, even call them lorries. I wouldn't even know what to call them. Like flatbed, you know, um, there were so many like challenges with this project so many and I wasn't just working with an artist I was working with an engineering team I was working with logistics I was working with customs people I was working with so many different people and the expectations from the management yeah no the, the management yeah, are yeah. great I mean <laughs> they were they loved everything and they were happy and they were so like you know that with all the challenges there they were very much it's incredible patient, the things yeah. you need to know um, I remember one of my one of, the, one of the first things I did when started working after college was I, I need to get some some 35 millimeter film uh, in the outside the country and I wasn't even aware how much of a customs work it is and it's a cultural good so you cannot just put it in a bag and send it out. So yeah, the paperwork and documentation and all of it while you're actually creating something very artistic. Yeah, I mean, like, and this is like, because it's like a, a huge sculpture, it wasn't just, hey, we're going to put the sculpture on. No, it was like, oh, we need to do the base for it. The base alone um, took a couple of months for us to, to, to put on the ground, to test, to fix the under part of it. So it was, it was a lot. Like in the end, after a year and a half, I think everyone was relieved that it was done. Um, but it was it was fantastic. And it's like, OK, true, we didn't work with a local artist and everyone. A lot of people gave me that comment, but um, I don't think anyone else could have pulled it off. Like this, this, the artist, uh, Matar Ben Lahij, he he knows he knows sculptures. He knows how to work with sculptures. He's done huge projects before. Um, he did the facade of the Museum of the Future the one on Sheikh Zayed Road in Dubai. So he knows, he knows his his stuff. Yeah, like, so... The, you, and there's and you, value in this, um, in the diversity of the offer you have in your own country. There's value in reaching out to other artists regionally. Oh, yeah, exactly. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, like, uh, okay, I, I'm all for supporting Kuwaiti artists. but Which is what you do daily. Yeah. Basically, your work, yeah. But, like, there's nothing mm. wrong with bringing a, a, a taste of other other work in Kuwait. So, so let's say we, if we had, like, a, a well-known sculpture come and put something in Kuwait, like, what's wrong with that? Yeah, no, that's yeah. actually great and a yeah. great opportunity to share knowledge and experience. Yeah, I mean, and he was so happy because he's never done anything in Kuwait. So mm. this was his first kind of, imprint in, mm. in Kuwait and you know just to have that and like you know with exhibitions they come and go like you do the exhibition you take it down it's gone like all you have left is 
the documentation. But something like this, no, like this is going to last a while. Like, you're, you know, this, this is going to last a long time. They might outlive me. My, my kid would be able to see it, be like, oh, mom did this, you yeah, know? That yeah. makes sense. Perfect yeah. sense. Yeah, and you, people drive by it and see it. And a lot of people are like, oh, hey, Shaitara, we didn't know you, you did this or you were involved in it. I think this is my, um, my challenge as, as a, my personal challenge and my challenge as a curator is that I'm bad at marketing. <laughs> I'm, ba- I'm, I'm okay. I can, mar- I can support artists and market, but the stuff that I do for myself, I'm pretty bad at it. Like I, I'm not really that active on Instagram. Well, I, I believe that you know you probably know yourself best. At the same time, you have an amazing name and reputation. Yeah, I feel like because I am the, I came from the ger- generation that like social media wasn't, you know, like it wasn't my, it didn't define my work and it didn't define who I am so I don't really care for by the time it came you you established yourself yeah I was already sure. like yeah, th- yeah. you know I've been doing like by that time so I didn't really so to me it's just like oh it's just like proof of of life like oh hey we we've, we did this oh we did that like if you want to come see it do that but for me to sit and post on stories and stuff i'm like oh i don't have i don't have the energy for that i'm too focused on like yeah, what i'm the doing actual work yeah what are some other projects uh that you would like to share um i These think are the best stories i mean yeah that was mm. in terms of like scale and, yeah, and, the complexity. and yeah. Mm. but i think another one that was really cool that we did was when i was with when i was at when i had the gallery space It was a passion project, if you will. Uh, it was a, a something we thought of, I thought of that. Hey, um, let's say I love hip hop a lot. Like it, to me, uh, hip hop is like my favorite genre of music. Um, it, it really defined defined my personality growing up. It defined my style, the way I thought, what I did, especially in college as well. Like all the concerts that I used to go to, it inspired my sister to become a dj mm. you know me mm-hmm. playing the music that i did and whatnot so i'm like okay i really want to do something that's not art that's like how that's something that's not tangible like okay music how do we make an exhibition about music um so we did an exhibition that was a collabor- collaboration between me my sister and uh Tariq Adumi. he does like a kicks he has like a insane collection of sneakers and he's like a sneaker head and he has like a big following so we did an exhibition about the influence on hip-hop uh, how hip-hop influenced sneaker culture mm-hmm. so this was like it wasn't just like hey let's just put a bunch of sneakers on and tag some music to it no this was research done we chose sneakers the, like iconic sneakers like the air jordans the air max like uh the Cortez or whatever, like different sneakers that define, that were basically like kind of, which was helped define specific songs in, mm-hmm. in hip hop, you know? So, and each, it wasn't like artworks. Okay. So you, you have the sneaker. It was on, the sneaker was on display and um, behind it was like a, a barcode that you can click on and listen to the snippets that would mention the sneaker and different hip hop songs. And then there was a write up about it. So this was like a very heavily research based exhibition, but it was also really fun. I mean, it's the kind of exhibition that you would see in a museum. Yeah. You know, like for a small gallery space, maybe it was like a little too much, you know, but at, even in the opening, we had like a DJ um, playing. Everyone came dressed in like their-, of their their finest like kicks you know we did a coloring book for it we did like a mixtape there was so much merch that came with it um we had a talk we had like a closing night thing so that for me was one of the greatest exhibitions i've ever done because it was like oh we we did it out of love and we did it, it we put so much work into it that well maybe people don't realize it and this is when i really felt like oh there's a lot of work when it comes to these types of exhibitions when you're looking into history yeah and dealing with two different people 
uh, working with two other people who are collaborative in this. So it was nice. What prompts you to work with uh, a relatively small and new entities, for instance, such as Prominent Culture Center? I mean, we knew each other from before, briefly, um, also through arts and culture. Um, what I personally like is your extremely responsible approach oh, thank to you thank you yeah everything is on time everything is on cue oh, yeah, yeah. that's everything the virgo in me <laughs> care of which is rare it's these are rare qualities nowadays oh, to be honest like a, to be a curator you're like a, you know like you you have to lay down the foundation work you have to be a good time you have to have great time management you have to be a good organizer Um, you have to be a therapist too, to the artists and to the people around you. You have to be like, it's it's a full on approach. It's not like, oh, hey, I'm just going to pick art and whatever. No, like you need to be good. And for me, just to to be able to manage my my business, because it's like a one man show, visual therapy. Okay, true. I have one woman show one in your case. Yeah, one woman, woman. Yeah, one woman show. Yeah. So like in order for me to, to be able to manage my projects, I have several projects happening in one. Yeah, I have good a good time management. I am glad that uh, we decided not to do something just uh, one off, but this is a continuing project. And also that we've decided to have uh, artists actually on spot work and create art in a very uh, unusual, uncommon space because we do it here at the commercial center where we're located. But it changes the energy of the space, having them around and uh, having you come and critique and consult with them. And I've seen them change and grow no matter where they are uh, with their art, what state they're in, you know, what phase they're in. We've had really beginners. We've had more established artists. Um, and I'm happy that people want to come and work on the topics we give them. Um, and also... Uh, the most important event throughout the year is the exhibition that happens after it. And I've seen you, uh, it, it's relatively small given it's two artists and a few um, artwork they create during that time, but at the same time it grows into something larger. It just shows how curation is has to have an impeccable approach no matter what you're showcasing. Yeah, I mean, for me, like I, I love working with with you guys the PCC I mean it's one of my favorite kind of organizations to work with because very happy to hear yeah that. you guys like do a lot and it's it's very admirable what, what you guys do um, and inject into the scene and the way you support the artists and I love um, obviously with the residency I I, I I mean I, I love working on it and I would love to continue working on it and I think this is something that even if I'm ever not around like it needs to keep going because there's very few few organizations in Kuwait that offer these types of residencies to to artists and it's amazing to see how an idea is, starts from a paper just words to a finished project and to me that's like I love that like it's it's like candy to me you know I love seeing things kind of grow and me being a part of this process and kind of helping and honing that growth um, to me it, 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 it feels I feel very accomplished at the end of the exhibition it's not like hey here's a bunch of artwork let's do something with it no it's no. the same feeling we um, and it's very complex um, like I said because there are so many things to take care of um, first during those two months working and a lot of artists actually even when chosen don't really come with a final idea what they want to do and your work there is um, is uh, needed and uh, crucial yeah at this point what, what i think is necessary is just conversation you know um like understanding the like where they they are in their head the artist and trying to pick their brain not telling them what to do but kind of giving them throwing little seeds in them you know uh, letting them try out different things or hey maybe we if you well, how about if you try this direction or maybe let's give this direction a go and then letting them have their aha moment by themselves but obviously me in the back being like, yay yes this is what we're, we're you know, this is what we... What it is about. Yeah. yeah, and what we want, you know. And, you know, just kind of developing that friendship and comf comfort 
with the artist for them to feel like that they can, you know, uh, pick up the phone and call me or send me texts and whatever and not feel like it's very like formal. Like, no, I'm I'm at the end of the day, like I want to be your friend. Maybe we're not going to be buddies, you know, yeah, but yeah. but that brings the best yeah, results. Exactly. Like the you, support they feel. Yeah. Yeah. The knowledge you share. Um, I know you um, you always like to end uh, on um, with a talk or with a closing night, these events uh, that we have during exhibition and that there's some sort of exchange and the artist's word is heard and their opinion and their um, their stance on their art. And uh, I'd like you to to tell us about the Divania you used to host. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because I, yeah, I've heard of it. We've spoken about it briefly, but, um, and hoping we'll, we'll have it maybe yeah. in the future again. Yeah. I mean, what was that? It was, uh, to be honest, it was an idea that me and a friend of mine who doesn't live in Kuwait anymore, we always thought at that time it would be, hey, it would be cool to, to like create a duania with like like-minded people and just kind of talk. The, at first it was like, oh, let's just gather people and like just, you know, have people talk and stuff. But then I was like, no, I mean, like people aren't just going to come. I mean, we need to have like a a, a goal. So I'm um, like, okay, let's, let's do it. So we'll call it Design D1. Although it not really doesn't have anything to do. It's okay. It has design related topics, but it's also our topics. But Design D1 just had a nice ring to it. Yeah. So we called it Design Duan and we would like for a while we were doing it monthly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the Instagram account is still active. So people okay. can, it's at Design Duan. You can go in and see what we used to <laughs> do. Right. Um, we would get, we would gather in like different places, like different galleries, different, you know, just random places. I remember I did one even at AUK and just each month we'd have a topic and You'd have regulars that would come, but then you'd have new people. And it's just like, obviously, like people who are interested in the topic would come. And we would just sit and talk and I would lead the conversation. Um, I would have like notes, but it wasn't like, oh, my God, like, you know, but it's just like, oh, hey, this is like kind of the topic. It wasn't scripted, but at the no, same no, time. No, no, no. We just kind of wanted to get the conversation going and then touch on specific points. That way people leave feeling that, oh, OK, like. Yeah, I, I kind of learned something new or I kind of like it, you know. A lot of inspiration stems from, from these moments. Uh, we've had a few young people who were really fascinated with the fact that there is a curator uh, who came to the exhibition and realized what your work is. And uh, we had a young lady who said, I want to be a curator yeah. and I, I'm now inspired. Yeah. And that's huge. Yeah, that is that's, huge. That is immense. To be honest, like knowing what I know now, like back in the day, like obviously we all we all wish that we did something different. Like, I'm like, oh, okay, maybe I, I should have went to school for like art history or museum studies. But at the end of the day, I feel like in, when it comes to art, if you're not an artist and if you're not trying to take it to a serious level, a curator, you don't really need to, to study curation. I feel like a lot of it comes with experience and a lot of it's you know, you can you can go do residencies, you can go take like short courses, even long courses as well to kind of really... Do you still, uh, do you still pursue art, your own art? Do no, you paint? Do you draw? unfortunately, I don't. Do like, you do I, it with a kid? Yeah, I mean, he, he loves to color and mm -hmm. stuff. But like, uh, I mean, like when, when he gets a little older, we can expose. Like, I don't want to force what it is that I do on him. But uh, I, I we, we do go to like museums and things like that. Like when, when we travel, like I still like that. That's still my thing. Like I, I go and even with my husband, like my husband loves art. Um, and he always tells me that, oh, hey, you, you need to market yourself more. You need to do this and you need to. I'm like, you know what? I've been doing this for a while. I kind of know what I'm doing. You know, I, I, I if I feel like I need a little push in this direction or push in that I'll do it like I, I know my myself and kind of like the the direction I want to take and the vision um yeah you're at the time and age when you really know who you are and what you want yeah and mm. I feel like okay like I'm saying this very confidently because we're the same age yeah so exactly. I kind of feel it yeah yeah I'm not gonna go back to school and do my master's or, or that did cross my mind but then I was like you know what? what what's that gonna do for me you know I just wasted two years what I could be like doing actual work in and you know why I'm, I'm, I'm like, I've had so much momentum now. Why am I going to stop it? Just because I, I want to have a degree like well, a degree doesn't define. Yeah, that's true. 
Unless you are an um, want, in academia, want to I be mean, like you a, want to, yeah, or you want to be like a an, a professional artist, of course, because a lot of or want to work in a museum. I think if I really wanted to work in a museum, like you know, they want someone who has like a um, a master's in like art history or museum studies or curation. But even working in a museum, it's limiting as well because. I think working in a gallery is way more interesting than working in a museum. Um, has more pace, probably. Yeah, with museums, they're very much, um, they go by guidelines. It's very formal. It's very, you know. Um, what is in plans? Would you share with us, if plans, possible? Um, I think for me, it's just kind of um, keep, keep things going with the residencies, um, working on that. Um, really um, kind of focusing as well on the mentorship program that I do with um, the youth, um, working on that, keep that growing and just kind of really just like stay busy, like stay a staying active. Because I think, you know, in Kuwait, like if that's the thing in, in Kuwait as well, like if you don't do stuff regularly, people forget about you. And I think, I think in general, that's, common all around the world but um it's just to keep you know being active keep working with artists keep making sure that they they know that you exist still that you're still working that hey um you know and uh, keeping an eye out for for interesting artists like for example tomorrow i'm going to have coffee with this artist that i've been following on instagram that i really like and i'd like to do an exhibition with her like next season Let's see how it goes. Like, let's get the conversation started. So this is the time right now between May, June, July is when I start planning my upcoming next, yeah, season. season. Yeah. So I already have things like in the pipeline. So it's it's important to just, you know, keep that flow going, keep that momentum going. And even for me, just to keep that like passion and interest and energy going Because, I mean, that's kind of what keeps me, you know, alive. Like, I don't have, at this point right now, it's been 15 years going on 16 with visual therapy. I know nothing else but visual therapy. I'm never, I'm not never going to go work in an office or in a corporate job or that, you know, that's not even in my, like. Well, that sounds very, um, very inspiring, I would say, for a lot of people who want to opt to work for themselves. Yeah. But mind you, it and took 15 years. I understand. You know? It's it, hard work. Yeah. And it, and it was like a very slow growth. It was very organic, but slow and steady. But I think slow and steady is what lasts rather than just spiking up and, you know. Yeah. So I've seen a lot of other kind of initiatives that happen around the same time as me. Um, kind of just diffuse and fizzle out you know and i'm like proud that i'm still going You're still there yeah. yeah although uh my direction has changed but i my direction changed because the needs changed because things around me changed and i adapt to what's kind of required around me and i think that's important in order to survive you know can't be stuck in your specific ways of doing things no you yeah have, you must you have be to ready adapt. to change yeah yeah But still keep that, um, the values. My values are still the same. I still, you know, um, have specific, like, things that I look out for. Yeah. I'm still a bit old school in, in what I do and what I require and what I need from artists. Like, when I see an artist that doesn't have a website, I'm like, what are you doing? Oh, I have an Instagram account. I'm like, no, it's not enough. I mean, it's not enough. Instagram is a visual platform. People look at it or whatever, but like move on. Yeah, you need a website. If you mm. you need a website where you put your content, you put your words, you put your statements, you put your like your their images are bigger. You know, things like that. Um, I'm still very much old school about, and I think the art world in general, like that's they're the same. You know, as much as we try to become new and adapt to like the new 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 that's happening, there are still old school things that are instilled in us that kind of you is follow. what makes us like strong and you know grounded it was really a delight having you here oh, today it's always a delight talking to you and uh, we'll see you very soon yes. thank you for coming thank to you. Culture Corner thank you for having me